The Tom Woods Show, episode 1970. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, don't even think about missing the libertarian event of the year the 2000th episode of The Tom Woods Show, live in Orlando, featuring many of your favorites from The Tom Woods Show. And Michael Malice says his special surprise guest, whose identity I myself don't even know, will bring the house down. Cost nothing to attend. Register at TomWoods2000.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. This is our 9-11 episode, and I had initially thought that I would release it on Friday, the day before 9-11, because I do a Monday through Friday podcast. But then suddenly the crazy Biden COVID nonsense came out and I had to do an impromptu episode on that. But you're gonna enjoy this episode because my guest today is Daniel McAdams. And you may know him as the co-host of the Ron Paul Liberty Report. He is executive director of the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity and served as an advisor on foreign affairs and civil liberties to Congressman Paul from 2001 until 2012. Now let's jump into my conversation with Daniel, but point out that when I say in the episode that I only do a Monday through Friday podcast, this is the closest we can get to 9-11, I didn't know at that time (laughs) what Joe Biden was gonna dump on us and that that would push this episode into next week. Again, the kind of things that podcasters become neurotic about, it's ridiculous, right? Nobody cares. Why do I even feel the need to point this out I don't know. That's my personality coming through. But hope you enjoy this episode. And with that, here is my conversation with Daniel McAdams. I am so glad that Ron Paul Institute had such a successful conference over the past weekend. I saw the photographs and it was just packed and people are enthusiastic and it's just tremendous. Dr. Paul last month turned 86 and it's astonishing to me that he shows no sign of slowing down. I just saw him last month in my neck of the woods in Kissimmee, Florida, for an event with Young Americans for Liberty. And I'll tell you, Daniel, maybe you don't know this, but they set it up so that I was to, at the end of my talk, break the bad news to everybody. And I guess I thought everybody knew it already. I I didn't know the plan exactly right, but that Dr. Paul would have to be addressing us via video feed. But in fact, he was there in person. So you get them mentally prepared for, yeah, he's just gonna be on video feed. So I point to the video screen and there he is, for about seven seconds, starting to give a talk. And then all the power goes out. And now people are really frustrated. So there's now there's not even a video screen. They're really frustrated. But then all of a sudden, Guns N' Roses' Welcome to the Jungle starts. And Dr. Paul storms onto the stage. The place is in, it's absolute pandemonium. (laughs) Just amazing. (laughs) And he's 86. I just love, that is the 86-year-old man I I aspire to be, Daniel, someday. (laughs) All of us do. And I was on the other end of that, Tom, when he was recording the thing. And I, I wasn't in on any of what was going to happen, obviously. And I'm wondering, why the heck is he doing this? What's going on here? <laughs> right, what, are they, you know. <laughs> what are they asking of him now? <laughs> yes, right. It's, it's always some crazy request, right? To, what a good sport he was to do that. Well, anyway. That brilliant. Yeah. Oh, I, I just loved that. I Because at first I was the bad guy. Everybody was booing when I said he's going to be on a video screen. I said, wait a minute, you loved me five minutes ago. What's going on here? But, uh, oh, what what fun that was. And, and people on Twitter were all saying, boy, yeah, Woods totally scammed us. We all fell for it. <laughs> and then Dr. Paul walks up. Classic. Okay. So as this episode is being released, it's being released on September 10th. This is a Monday through Friday podcast, Saturday is the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Unbelievable that it's been that long. And I want to have you on to, to, just to think back about it 20 years later. And in particular, I want to start off on September 11th and ask you, first of all, what exactly was your role in Dr. Paul's office at that time? My role in Dr. Paul's office was sitting at home waiting for Joe Becker to call me and tell me when I could join Dr. Paul's office. Oh, it hadn't <laughs> happened yet. No, no, he called me. Joe was uh, Dr. Paul's, uh, I think, his uh, deputy chief of staff at the time. And he had called me a few days ago saying, hey, you know, I'm I'm thinking of leaving, but we want to make sure that uh, because we're in the middle of a session that I can be replaced with somebody who can kind of just step in and start the job, you know, someone we know. And, you know, I had been published on the Rockwell, antiwar.com, and was, you know, is somewhat known in that way. So he just kind of wanted to smooth away because Dr. Paul is not a big fan of change, you know, especially when it 
it's thrust upon him. So I was sitting there, I'm sitting there in, the, in my living room. We have a skylight. We're on the third floor in Arlington. And all of a sudden, you know what hits the fan. And we can go into details about what exactly happened. But we did certainly see whatever it was that flew over our building before the impact. And uh, of course, you know, it was horror and terror. But when that sort of wore off, I thought, oh, man, what luck. You know, now Joe's not going to quit and I'm not going to get my dream job. <laughs> so, so my first reaction was not exactly that, but it wasn't that far after that I was worried about that. So when did you start in as an advisor? to the congressman? It was probably a couple of, well, no, I mean, it, it had to have been just a few days later, actually, because they put the Patriot Act through very quickly after the attack. And I know that I was there for that. Norman Singleton, my colleague at the time, was working on it. It was Tom Lizardo, who was the chief of staff. And I, I wasn't actively involved in the legislation, but I was watching it happen. And I was getting, I'll tell you what, I was getting a college degree in about two days, about scrambling about what it was like to work in Ron Paul's office, you know, because it was such a different kind of office. It wasn't like, oh, we better call up the speaker and say how we should vote. It was like, this thing is an absolute piece of crap. How are we going to explain to people why it's such a piece of crap in such a time of heightened sensitivities, of heightened emotions, where the right was all, you know, demanding things? So it was a great first lesson for me that and the uh, Declaration of War in Afghanistan was a great first lesson. It was a baptism of fire, Tom. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Now, had you ever met Dr. Paul before this time? I hadn't in person, interestingly enough. You know, I was, I was living in Europe at the time. I was living in Hungary, and I was doing a lot of work in the Balkans. And uh, that's how I actually got to, to know Ron Paul through his work, because I wasn't particularly involved in politics. I'm a little embarrassed to say but I was kind of like a, I was a young, I was, it was called Republicans Abroad Hungary. I was a vice president. I wasn't very active, but I just knew that I wasn't a liberal, you know, in that sense. But I started realizing as I was going to the Balkans, I was going to Yugoslavia, and I was reading this guy called Ron Paul from Texas, who was so exactly right. Don't bomb Serbia. Don't bomb Yugoslavia. This is going to be a nightmare, a disaster. And so when I did get back to the U.S. and got a job in D.C., I just wanted to go in and, and meet someone and say, hey, you guys really made an impact. You were really correct. Dr. Paul was really correct. And it really made an impact. And that was Joe Becker. And Joe, I guess he just kind of filed it away. And then uh, a few weeks or however many later, because I was fired from my job, by the way. So I was sitting there without a job and he called. So it was a miracle, you know, and I have I continue to be thankful to Joe and to a certain person higher above than Joe, <laughs> even higher than Dr. Paul for that great bit of luck. Well, yes, right, right, indeed. Well, and then, of course, now, I'm sure you wouldn't have guessed that you would be co-hosting the Ron Paul Liberty Report someday, so it, it sure did work out. What was your first, do you recall your first conversation with Dr. Paul in his office, what that was like? I do indeed, because it was my interview with him. Because, you know, we had to, you had to go through the gauntlet. You know, I had to go through Joe Becker, then I had to go through Tom Lizardo, then I had to have dinner with Kent Snyder and David... Um, What's, I forget his, his last name now, but David and Kent. And then finally, when I got to all of that, I could meet Dr. Paul. And he was just the nicest person in the world. And he asked me, point blank, he said, now you're familiar with libertarian views, the libertarian position on different issues. Are there any issues that you have trouble with, you have problems with? And I mean, I'm, I'm again, a little embarrassed to say this, but it's a fact. I said, I said, Dr. Paul, I, I'm having a hard time with the drug war stuff because I lost a best friend who was a drug addict and I uh, just see how horrible it is. And he didn't start lecturing me. He didn't scowl. He didn't uh, say, okay, that's it. You're out of here. He just kind of gave a little smile and said, well, just keep reading about it. You'll get it. You'll get it. Oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was great. And I did. Absolutely. I understood that I can hold both positions simultaneously. I abhor the use of some of these narcotics because I know what they do to people, but I don't think the state should put people in cages for doing it. So right, thanks right. to Dr. Paul. So the subject of foreign policy, given your area of expertise, had to come up in that interview. Yeah, that was easy stuff though. Because yeah. we were totally in agreement. And I You agreed completely. Yeah, and, and it was I I agreed because I read Lou Rockwell and I read Ron Paul because it you know, the entire time, I mean I was working on a book, I had a fellowship to do a book on US foreign policy. And the book was basically 
a post-communist critique of U.S. foreign policy in that under the Clinton administration, they were giving all of the money to the commies and the so-called reform commies. And what a disaster that was. We need to support the good guys, support the good conservatives. And in the course of writing that book, unfortunately, when I was about three quarters finished with it, I realized that the whole basis is wrong, that Lou Rockwell, Ron Paul, Justin Romando, they're all right. We shouldn't support anyone. We should completely disengage in terms of favoring or disfavoring one side or the other. So it was a revelation. I guess it was worth the cost of a book, Tom, <laughs> but, uh, but it was a real revelation that came through experience, I have to say, not through some great intellectual discovery. All right, so if you were there relatively early on, this was a time in U.S. history when uh, there was real unanimity. I mean, there was no Democrats or Republicans. George W. Bush had very high approval ratings, which is very strange. I mean, this disaster happened under his watch, and so everybody suddenly decided they liked George W. Bush. And Harry Brown wrote something pretty quickly, very Ron Paul-esque, about the folly of foreign intervention. But it must have been a pretty lonely time. I mean, did you feel like you had allies in Congress? No, it was, well, certainly it was terrible at first. I would say it's probably worse in the run-up to the Iraq War. Uh, oh, and yeah. the Iraq War itself, the early part of that. Because as you see, there was a certain, there was an unanimity in that we had to do something after this. And it was a very difficult time in Dr. Paul's office because, you know, I wasn't there for the deliberation over the vote on Afghanistan. But, uh, you know, I understand that it could have gone either way and the good case could have been made for a no. And he certainly knew that. Certainly he said in public, you know, if I'd known what I know now. But, you know, that was tough. It was only Barbara Lee, you know, and Ron yeah. was from a Bible Belt district. And it wasn't that he did it for political reasons. But what they did in the office, which is what my entire experience of working for Ron Paul was, was let's find another alternative too. That okay, yeah, this is the, this is the juggernaut. But let's look at something different. And that's when they came up with the market reprisal proposal, which, of course, was laughed at. Oh, what a joke. What a coop this guy is going out and just getting the guys who attacked us. That's nutty as heck. You know, but in retrospect, I think that's aged very well, the idea of doing it that way rather than spending 20 years and how many trillions of dollars and leaving the place worse than when we than when we invaded. But it was a difficult time policy wise to try to use it as a teaching moment as well. I love the market reprisal proposal because it really does expose who's who out there and when you gauge people's reaction to it. Because it's almost like some people have so taken for granted that war or that getting justice has to mean involving much of the population of the targeted country. Whereas sometimes we joke about, you know, wouldn't it be better if, let's say, you know, a couple of years later with the Iraq war, if Saddam and George W. Bush could just get in a boxing ring and settle it among themselves and leave <laughs> the rest of us alone. But the thing is, there is a little bit of wisdom in that because I don't have anything to do with this. Yeah, I guess some of my tax money is being used for it, but that's against my will. I don't want to have anything to do with this. The average Iraqi has nothing to do with any of this. So of course we should want to just target the particular people who are involved. And yet for some reason, this is viewed as preposterous. Whereas the preposterous thing should be, well, we're gonna drop some bombs and it's a absolute certainty that we're gonna wipe out a lot of innocent people. That, that's just an unavoidable certainty. That's considered, well, that's, you know, that's just the way statecraft works and that's considered normal. But Dr. Paul's proposal, going back to the founding fathers, is the crazy one. Yeah, it's the crazy one, indeed. So let me ask you this. Obviously, Dr. Paul's views on this became much, much more widely known when he ran for president and he had the famous you know, exchange with Rudy Giuliani in the presidential debates where he said, in effect, they're over here because we're over there. Yeah. And you take that away and you're gonna, and you just need to understand that if you have a world empire, there are gonna be some downsides to it. And maybe you think the downsides are worth it. okay but at least have the conversation with the American public honestly. And that conversation has never occurred. I mean, that was the gist of what he was saying. What do you think about that thesis? You know, I've come to the conclusion that the entirety of our problems with foreign policy is that it's completely driven by special interests. And that might be a cliche saying, but I mean it in the exact sense of the word. The machine together, and you know, Chuck Spinney would call it a self-licking ice cream cone, 
The machine works together so well to ensure that war is the only possible outcome to any foreign policy stimulus that there appears to be almost no way to avoid it. When you talk about the interest of the military industrial complex, and some people stop there, but that's only the beginning. You have the humanitarian industrial complex. They have interest in it. You have now the medical industrial complex. They have interest in it. And you have the Washington Beltway think tank complex, and they have an interest in it. And, you know, um, my good friend Ray McGovern calls it the Mickey Mac. And I don't even remember what all the acronym stands for. But Washington is literally only geared for war. So the only way to break this cycle is to somehow reach out and touch middle America and let them know that this is the most colossal ripoff in history. And I think just that is just the only way to fight it now after all these years. Hey, everybody, if you're a small business getting buried by your competition or just want an edge on your competition, then I highly recommend Persist SEO. They'll help you build your brand, your reputation, and your lead flow. If you're a small local business, you're trying to compete against large companies in the service industry, you can increase your visibility with Persist SEO. What if you're not getting any leads or a very small number of leads coming in on a consistent basis? Well, website search engine and conversion optimization can help move the needle to a more prosperous business model. And my gosh, if you're tired of cold calling, you can use your website as a lead generation engine. Or what if you're not showing up on the search engines or you're buried? Well, you'll get found on them with Persist SEO's expert search engine optimization. And if you're tired of dealing with search engine bureaucracies, Hire the digital marketing pros at Persist SEO to handle it. All you have to do is call 770-580-3736 or visit them at ineedseo.help for a free website audit and consultation. That's 770-580-3736 or ineedseo.help. Now that we've had 20 years of it and the Afghanistan thing has been wound down, looking back on it, being honest, can you say from the point of view of trying to contain or roll back, quote unquote, radical Islam, did any of this intervention do any good? Well, no, I mean, it did worse because we actually didn't dislike radical Islam. That was one of, the, one of the most important arrows in our quiver. In fact, we nurtured it and we armed it and we trained it in Syria and in Libya and throughout Africa as a great justification for further U.S. interventionism. We armed and, and trained al-Qaeda and ISIS in Syria, and Americans don't like to hear that because they were told that we bombed them. But in fact, as we did with Saddam, as we did with Noriega, we bombed a few and we allied with a few. That's how it works. That is the uh, Hegelian the dialectic at work in U.S. foreign policy. you know. And so, no, it did nothing to, to reduce radical Islam because they didn't want it to reduce radical Islam. They wanted to use it as a way of overthrowing secular governments in the Middle East. And you say, well, why the heck would they do that? Well, as Lenin said, the worse, the better. You know, if you have all these people in there, then we have to remain in there. And there are so many interests that demand that we remain there. All of the above ones that I mentioned, then you have the very strong Israel lobby, both among evangelicals in the U.S. who vote Republican and among, you know, out of Jewish Americans, people who are feel otherwise uh, predisposed to support Israel, and uh, which I would add is, has done no favors for that country, right? Let's, let's be honest. If you love Israel, you don't want the United States military in the Middle East in perpetuity. But all of these interests come together to just demand a continued war. And one of the things that helps to perpetuate it is that unfortunately so many Americans just don't know the background. It's the way Scott Horton puts it is, we all act as if history began 10 minutes ago. So something <laughs> like September 11th happens and we just think, well, here's just some arbitrary thing that occurred. And if you try to give some explanation of what might have motivated it, then you're making excuses for the terrorists or whatever, which is such a dumb, low IQ argument. If I am a detective and there's a murder, I wanna know the motive, not because I'm looking to excuse the murder. Yeah. I want to understand the situation better. And so that has been a, a major problem with a lot of American wars. Like, look at what happened. We were just innocently standing. We were innocent bystanders. And all of a sudden, we were attacked. It reminds me of a just a small bit from one of Dave Smith's comedy routines. But 
he's talking about September 11th and trying to explain to Americans, well, you know, part of this is we have been bombing them for years and years and years. And, and Dave, you know, acting like a regular American says, what? That doesn't sound like us. <laughs> you know, this is not something anybody really knows about. You know, what, what was going on in the 1990s? Or, or the sanctions, the sanctions on Iraq in the 1990s. It's so interesting to look back on that, that it was all the establishment you know, they didn't have Twitter in those days, but all the blue checks, you know, those types yeah. of people who all made excuses for that sort of thing. And the kind of people who spoke out about it as a humanitarian atrocity were people on the far left or Pat Buchanan. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it goes to show you don't, and Dr. Paul did such a service for us in showing you don't have to be a commie pinko to be against the wars. I mean, I think he has given permission to people to say, yeah, this was a real, you know, what we did in Afghanistan was an unbelievable waste of resources. And my gosh, we got to not do that again. I think at this point, there's a, at least a chunk of the Republican Party that is more anti-intervention than the Democrats now. Oh, I think that's absolutely true. And I think in a further bit of good news, I think what we're starting to see among the Republican Party are people who are beginning to question the military. And I think that's yes. a very positive development. They realize they can criticize military leadership without hating the troops, you know, because as you and I know, some grunt with a rifle is not out there making decisions. So I think that is a very healthy thing. They're no longer feeling unpatriotic if they question, because they saw whatever you think of Trump, they saw what the military and, and the intelligence community, by the way, especially under Brennan and Clapper, et cetera, they saw what these monsters were capable of, regardless of the character of the president, they were capable of overturning an election. And we saw that out in front immediately in the first impeachment hearing when Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, remember him? Well, we had to do this because the president on Ukraine policy was going against the interagency perspective, the interagency conclusion. So you, I think the American public, and I think especially the Trump people, began to understand that there is you know, I, I hate using the term deep state, but there are some very bad people there who have been in control and want to remain in control and will do literally anything, including mass murder, to keep in control. It's frightening, but I think the more people wake up, and this, I can hear Dr. Paul's voice in my ear, the more we wake people up, the better the chances that we get through this thing. Well, I've been reading the remarks of people in the military and older folks who served in the military asking the question, would I recommend a military career to a young person today? And the answer is no. Yeah. So that's another really astonishing thing. I think that's also happening in medicine. Would I recommend that some young person become a doctor? What, under these circumstances, with the insane levels of, of regulation and threats of more regulation, whatever, forget that. Or, or start a direct primary care practice, but don't get caught up in the in the health industrial complex, you'll, you'll never get out. Yeah. Now, speaking of health, by the way, you know, one of the themes of your event did have to do with what we're facing with our public health establishment. And it's interesting to me, and I wonder what the connection is, but when we think about who led the opposition to the, the ongoing multifaceted war on terror in terms of a public official in office. Well, it was Ron Paul. I mean, who was consistently anti-war and anti-intervention through the whole thing over and over and who was, who was in office for a big chunk of it. So we have him doing that. That was very unpopular in the Republican Party. He kept getting reelected in, for his seat in Texas. That was unpopular in the Republican Party. Then it became a little bit more popular because the Iraq war being a mistake suddenly became something that everybody knows and mm -hmm. everybody downplayed their initial support for it. Well, now that we've got Dr. Fauci and the COVID fiasco, and now you've got a lot of Republicans who did not like Ron Paul for his foreign policy, but they're at least smart enough to know that this approach to the virus has been stupid and counterproductive and idiotic, and who, again, is the most consistent voice out there. Dr. Paul and his son Rand in the Senate and Thomas Massey in the House. Well, gee, where'd they come from? They came from the Ron Paul revolution. 
If John McCain were with us today, he'd be Fauci 100%. Oh, yeah. If we had a President Mitt Romney, it would be Fauci. There'd be no difference. You would not be able to tell a difference. It would be Fauci running the show just as he is now. So all of a sudden, well, how about that? The guts that it takes to tell the whole world, or at least the, well, the world understood that he was right about the war on terror, but Americans didn't, to stand up and say to them, look, this is not the way to go. Well, when push comes to shove and you have the whole quote unquote, what we laughingly call the public health establishment and you know all the fashionable opinions saying we have to stay home and do all this other stuff, it's the same kind of guts that is required to stand up against that. Indeed. So do you think there's more of, is there, a, is there a, a more intimate connection between the two issues than I'm identifying, or is that really it? No, I think, you know, when, when Dr. Paul appears to a group and he says the revolution is alive and well, it's not just nostalgia or wishful thinking, you know, as you say, and as Dr. Paul would say, words have consequences, ideas have consequences. And I think you captured it beautifully, Tom, the revolution that Dr. Paul launched in 2008 and before is being carried by people like Rand in many ways and people like Thomas Massey in many ways and elsewhere. And people <laughs> that don't want to admit he was right knew he was right, you know, and this is not anything that has not been publicly discussed. But here's the real tragedy of Donald Trump. Donald Trump knew that Ron Paul was right too. And I know that because they had a telephone call back in April of 2020 that I helped set up between Dr. Paul and the president. And the one thing Dr. Paul told him, don't shut the country down. You know, it, that was it. This is the takeaway line. Don't shut the country down. Don't let them do this. And Trump said, yeah, I know. I agree with you. But the first person who dies, they're going to blame me. And so it was all yeah. about him. Yeah, I, I totally understand that. But I mean, that doesn't come to a surprise to me at all. I hate to say at the same time, not like in any way I would defend shutting down the country. But of course, every death in Florida is DeSantis's fault. Exactly, personally. Whereas, <laughs> whereas, you know, every death in Washington state is some mystery that we can't figure out because we've all followed the rules. We wouldn't even consider blaming our governor for that. And that is very hard. It would be, it would be very hard to be somebody in power knowing full well they're going to they're gonna say that yeah. to you. If you're going to fight back against that, you would have to surround yourself with the best people, the most knowledgeable people who will say, look, things are no worse here than in countries where, yeah, they're ruining your life and they have these deaths. <laughs> okay, I'm very sorry we have these deaths, but on the, the good news is I'm not ruining your life. I, it would have been great if Trump had press conferences where he had brought up, I mean, Scott Atlas was a great addition. Yeah, But if he had also brought out, they could go after him though by saying, well, he's just a radiologist. What The point of Scott Atlas was, I'm a public health expert yeah. and I am bringing a holistic approach to this where I look at the effects on society of the lockdowns and not just one thing at a time, like I'm seven years old, like Dr. Fauci. Well, we'll shut everything down and not consider what the fallout of that is. If he had brought in though people who were experts in epidemiology, if he had brought in, the people from the Great Barrington Declaration, at yeah. least Koldor from Harvard and Bhattacharya from Stanford. They're both very cool-headed. They're very likable. They're obviously geniuses. They come across very, very well in the media. Duh, what a missed opportunity. He should have done that. And I know Dr. Paul would have done that. Yeah. Well, you saw what happened to Atlas. I mean, he touched the machine and the machine touched him back. You know, and that, I think that goes to show, but it, it certainly could have worked. You know, maybe there was a kind of a laziness to Trump. That's sort of what I suspect. He didn't really like being president, I don't think. He didn't like all the stuff you have to do. And I don't blame him. The president has to do too much stuff. But 150 years ago, they didn't have to do hardly hardly any stuff. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> but no, you're well, not I, right. I'm told by Bhattacharya that Atlas is writing a book about what happened and inside the White House and whatever – and I have a funny feeling that's going to be pretty juicy. Yeah. We're going to want to read that thing. Well, in fact, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was one of our speakers at our conference, and he's just finishing a book on Fauci, an extensively researched, plenty of FOIA requests, detailed expose on Fauci's career and the lifelong criminality <laughs> of, of what he's done. So that's also something I think to look forward to. Oh, that would be nice, too. That guy cannot be taken down enough notches uh, as far as I'm It's unbelievable that this stuff is still going on. In fact, I remember a few months ago, 
I actually said to my email list, do you think I'm writing too much about COVID? Should I start? I mean, occasionally I write about another topic, but I was thinking, you know, it, is, it does seem like it's starting to wind down. I am getting some people saying, okay, time to start talking about other things. But then quote unquote Delta occurred. And now okay. everything that, well, so the approach is everything that didn't work the last time, we got to trot that all out again and, yeah. and and just act as if there are no exceptions to that. Act as if Denmark and Sweden are not completely back to normal. Yeah. Uh, Sweden is literally completely back to normal. You go there, you cannot tell anything is going on and they have no deaths. And so we have to act like that's not happening. Like it doesn't happen. Man, that shot sure was crap. We better get another. <laughs> yeah, I know. So now we're going to have the, the next shot. And, and the thing is, I'm pretty sure... I heard that Bill Maher has said he's not getting a third shot. Huh. And I know a, a friend of a friend was asked, uh, are you getting the third shot or the, a booster if it should come to that? And her response was, I've done my part. Now, this is an average person with no interest in politics whatsoever, not pro or anti-Fauci, doesn't know anything about it. I've done my part, was her answer. She's in her 20s. Interesting. This is not going to happen. But if Fauci is, is insinuating that you would need the booster to be considered fully vaccinated, now you're really telling me that you're in major cities going to shut off all the things that people enjoy because you haven't gotten the third shot or the, the second booster or the 12th. At some point, this has to come apart because average people just aren't going to keep doing that. Yeah, and I think the laboratory is Israel. I mean, they've, they were very obedient. They got all their shots and they have the highest infection rate in the world. And now the Israeli government is saying you need to have two, three, four, five of them. I think there's going to come a point where they don't want to hear that anymore and they're going to do something about it, you know. But it's, it's. I mean, I was just before we started talking, Tom, I was just glancing through the news and I was looking at this article in the New York Post a couple of days ago. And here's the first sentence. The National Institutes of Health has announced a $1.67 million study to investigate reports that suggest the COVID-19 vaccine may come with an unexpected impact on reproductive health. Gee, now's a good time to study that after yeah. you put the shot in the arm of all of these childbearing age. And, you know, that was considered a conspiracy theory when people said, well, the shot, you know, you may make it, you know, maybe they just want to make us sterile, whatever, what have you. Oh, you're, you're not, you're a conspiracy theorist. Now they're saying, gosh, we probably should study that at some point. I mean, <laughs> these people are not experts. They're the opposite of experts. And especially the ones planning the response. Nothing they do works. And then when curves naturally come down, and we know they naturally come down because they're coming down in places that have openly defied all these different things. Like uh, in February, February, second week of February, Iowa just got rid of all its restrictions. But other Midwestern states didn't do so till later. But all the lines look identical. You cannot pick yes. Iowa out. There's no way to know. And yet they all sit around acting as if any of it did any good because they have to they have to claim that the masks brought it down or the staying at home yeah. brought it down because they can't say, well, everything we just told you to do was completely useless. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's there to see you've done a great job with charts. Charts don't lie. No. And you see it. And we don't have to be Nostradamus to predict that probably in the Northeast in the next few weeks, there's going to be an increase because we had the increase down in the Southwest and Southeast a few weeks ago. I mean, just cycles, like we had last year at this time. What, exactly. How interesting. Yeah, Believe yeah, yeah. it or not. And by <laughs> the, this goes back to, I was just going to say yeah. this goes back to the beginning where you said they act as if the world began 10 minutes yes, ago. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And that's another parallel. Yeah, that's another interesting parallel. Well, people could, not that they would, but you could look back to early on when I was writing about this. I didn't initially say that much about masks because I genuinely throughout this thing have tried to keep an open mind. Yeah. I didn't say that much about masks because I didn't know enough about it. And I thought to myself, well, maybe masks could be a way station on, on our way back to normal. That seemed plausible to me that that could be the case. And then when I looked at the charts and just country after country, you can't even tell when they started wearing masks. Was it at this part of the curve or that part? If they are as important an intervention as we're being told, it would be unambiguously clear on the chart. Even though there are other factors that work simultaneously, if masks are this important, they would they would override those and it would be clear from the chart. Exactly. But it's not, I mean, I forget if it was Malaysia or Thailand, one of these countries where they hadn't really been hit that hard. 
and they had masks all along. And then suddenly they had a literally 1 million percent rise in cases. And the usual thing that people say about masks, if you show them these charts, is, well, it would have been even worse without the masks. You tell me it would have been worse than a million percent increase? How much worse could it get? <laughs> you know, I mean, obviously these things are failing. And th these are societies with 95, 98 percent compliance rates. Yeah. We'd see some, anyway, and this you know not, another parallel. Daniel would be this would be one of these things that in five years, just like the Iraq War, they'll all be saying, oh, "I wasn't in favor of any of that." Oh, I never yeah. wore a mask. <laughs> <laughs> right, I never wore a mask. Oh my gosh! Uh, I miss the days when Dr. Fauci said, "There's no need for Americans to be to be walking around wearing masks," and then <laughs> explaining what the reasoning behind not wearing them was, and then saying, "Well, the the science changed. Literally nothing about the science changed. Not one thing." <laughs> changed. Yeah. I mean, okay, if it did, show us the study. We'd like yeah, to see it. I'd like to know what was the thing that, that got your attention. Anyway. All right. Let's take just one minute before we wrap up to talk about the Ron Paul Liberty Report, because man, have you guys been on point with that. Well, we have, you know, and it's been great to have so many increases in our subscriptions. But Tom, you know, we're in the same situation and we have to, and I can't say everything I want to say on the show. I'll be very honest because we live in a communist country. You know, we've fought tooth and nail for our third of a million subscribers for five years. We put everything into it. Thousands of, of uh, Liberty Reports, we do it every day of the week. You know, one word could get everything pulled down. So we have to be very careful. And, you know, I, I moved to Hungary right after communism fell. And so it was very fresh in the minds of people there. And I saw firsthand what it was like when people always were very careful. They bit their tongue. They said things a certain way. I thought it was goofy as hell. I couldn't figure out why they were acting that way. Sadly, I can, I can figure it out very, very well now. And it's very frightening what's happening to the country. I hate to leave on a negative note, but we continue to try. We don't, we don't change the view, but we may change a little bit of how it's delivered because we're afraid of these people. They're very evil people and they don't want the truth to get out. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. I have had a couple things taken down. One, I feel bad. It was a talk I gave for the Mises Institute back in November down in Texas, yes. November of 2020. And it was a 20 minute talk and it was it went insanely viral. At the time they took it down, it had over 800,000 views on YouTube and another half million on Facebook. And it was taken down. And, and the arguments, I did a whole episode of my podcast ripping apart the stupid I mean, I don't know where they get these idiots who do the so-called fact-checking, but I, I went right through that with no problem. But that wasn't on my channel. That was on the Mises Institute's channel. First strike they've ever gotten. And so I felt bad about that. I'm, I'm you know, if, if, I, <laughs> if I take my own channel down, okay, at least I'm not damaging my friends. I have one strike against me, and that is I had Ivor Cummins on the show twice. The first time oh, I had him you. on. <laughs> yeah, I know. Ivor Cummins is just an absolute hero. He's, He's the guy who, who got Eric Clapton. I think Clapton realized everything was wrong, but then he became convinced after reading Ivor Cummins and listening to Ivor Cummins. Anyway, so I had him on twice, and I, I use YouTube for the episodes. I don't, I frankly don't understand why people watch on YouTube. There's no video, but they, they do. And so if I get an extra few thousand listeners that way, I, I might as well do it. But the, the first Ivor Cummins episode, I checked it because I need to do it for the sponsors. It had something like 40,000 views on YouTube, even though there's no video. Wow. So just his name alone gets yeah. people. They don't know TomWoods.com is where I have my, they don't even know who I am. But Ivor Cummins, they want to consume everything he has. So the second time I had him on, even though he was no more controversial the second time, by that point, I actually think his name triggers review by YouTube at this point. That's because that thing was taken down almost instantly. Like almost before they could have really evaluated it. It was taken down from YouTube. So I think at this point, it's even people's names. I don't say that everything gets automatically taken down, but you know, if, if his name were Joe Smith, it would be much tougher. Yeah, yeah. But with a name like Ivor Cummins, you know, it's easy for them to flag that and say he's probably saying things he shouldn't be saying. The only so, thing worse would be if his last name was Mecton. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, it is hard for me because I, I'm not going to censor myself, but I do wonder, well, gee, if I have this guy on, I know it'll get taken down. So one thing I've considered doing is if I have a really controversial guest, you know, as I say, YouTube is not central to what I do at all because there's no video component to the Tom Woods show. 
And that's part of the reason for that is you guys have a video team and stuff. I do this. I'm a one man show five days a week. There's nobody, especially given I get these episodes in by the skin of my teeth every day. There's no video editor who would have the patience for me. Okay, it's 11.30 p.m. I'm done. Go edit the video. (laughs) It's just not going to happen. I'd love to do it. I'd love to start doing it, but I don't do it right now. So what I've thought about doing is if I do have an episode like that on the YouTube version, it would simply be me saying, hey, everybody, it's Tom Woods. This episode would be censored by YouTube. It's an absolute definite. So go over to Odyssey. Here's the link. This is where my channel is. And you can listen to it on a free speech platform. That's a good idea. And that way I keep my my channel intact and I'm able to get the information out there. Yeah, that's a good idea. Definitely. Yeah. Anyway. All right. So ronpaullibertyreport.com. That's actually your website, but you also have ronpaulinstitute.org. Yes. And I, I urge people to support the work you guys are doing. I mean, you guys are releasing this material for free to the world as a service every single weekday. It is a tremendous program doing such important work. And I, I hope people do support you. I mean, I've supported you guys a little bit here and there over the years. Yes. So I'm not asking you guys to do something I haven't done myself. So do check that out, Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. So any final word on that? Well, Tom, it's been great talking to you. You know, I just hope we can continue to do what we do. I think the darker days are ahead, but there is some light, at the, to be cliche, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. And, and you know, as, as Dr. Paul quoted, civilizations go insane in mass, but they recover one person at a time. And I think we're starting to see some of that. So if Dr. Paul were here, he would, he would try to tell us to be optimistic because we're going to win in the end. Darn right. That is exactly the way to think about it. So All right, Daniel, thanks so much for your time and continued success and continue the good work at the Ron Paul Liberty Report. Thank you, Tom. Okay, folks, before you go, do you like scary stories? Well, there is a maniac on the loose. The Maniac on the Loose Scary Stories podcast specializes in scary stories that will curdle your blood and send shivers down your spine. Steve Hudgens is the man behind it. He's an award-winning writer and filmmaker who recently crossed over into the podcasting world with Maniac on the Loose, Scary Stories. Steve writes the stories and narrates them. You can find Steve's podcast, books, and movies at maniacontheloose.com. And Steve, because he's smart, got his hosting through my link. And so I am delighted to promote something so unique and different to the Tom Woods Show audience. Come on, I know I have some scary story people out there. What a great idea for a podcast. So check that out. I'll also link to it at tomwoods.com slash 1970. And you know the drill. If you want me to promote a website you're thinking of creating, make sure you get your hosting through my link and I have a bunch of great bonuses for you. Won't cost you an extra cent, but that will really give you a nice advantage as you get started. Get the details on all that at tomwoods.com slash publicity. Paul Gottfried returns to the show tomorrow with his titanium ribs. We'll talk then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of the Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.